Hello, my name is Ben Joseph. Um, this is the Judge Ben Show. This is a program in which I interview guests about things that concern the legal system in Vermont. Uh, this is the first time I've done this uh, remotely. So if I stumble around, please understand that I'm not quite used to this. I'm sitting in, in my home computer trying to look into the uh, camera and look into what I'm seeing on the screen. Uh, my guest today is Dr. John Brooklyn. Dr. Brooklyn uh, is a physician who does a lot of work in Burlington and has dealt with a lot of people with uh, drug cases. So, Dr. Brooklyn, how long have you been in Vermont? Uh, I have been here on and off since 1975. Uh, I took a little break to go back to medical school in Rhode Island, but essentially uh, I've been practicing here since uh, uh, 1992 after I did my residency. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Are you working mostly in the Burlington area? Uh, three days a week in the Burlington area and two days a week in St. Albans. Wow. Okay. And uh, during that time, have you had patients who've had drug problems? Well, uh, in fact, most of my work tends to be with people with substance use issues. I, um, since 1992, when I graduated, have been working in the field of addiction medicine. Wow. Uh, studies. Um, looking at the use of buprenorphine, suboxone to treat opiate addiction. I've been involved with studies uh, treating cocaine, uh, nicotine, but routinely as a general practitioner, family medicine doctor, I routinely take care of people who have the spectrum of uh, substance use issues, yes. Wow. Well, then we're talking about thousands of people you've dealt with who have these problems. I have, yes, many thousands. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really very interesting. Well, to, just to get right to it, I want to go back to my topic outline to see I don't forget anything. Um, there was a recent radio report that um, over 100 people had died in Vermont in the last year because of overdose. Do you think that's accurate? Well, for the last three or four years, we've had about 100 to 105 cases of what are deemed opioid overdoses because of opioids. I think what you may have been referring to is this year with the coronavirus, we've actually seen an increase in people who've died from um, overdose. So I'm not surprised at all based on what I know from firsthand experience and uh, all the issues that have come about from coronavirus, isolation, drug use, drug access. Um, it's kind of a twin pandemic as we're calling it these days. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. So you think COVID has caused an increase in the number of people who die because of substance abuse? Yes, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a fact in the state of Vermont and nationwide. Uh, there's probably a 30 or 40 percent uh, uh, uptick this year. Um, and the belief is kind of three from what patients have told me. Uh, some of it has to do actually with... Um, the, ex the, the excess stimulus money that was uh, presented to people who um, used it to buy lots of uh, cocaine or heroin. Um, we also know that because of the drug supply not coming up from Mexico, which is our typical uh, access point for heroin, there's a lot more fentanyl now. Um, people have told me all kinds of stories about funny looking powders that they've been sold. So I think that there's a real uh, change in the market forces where previously you might have known who your supplier were was and now it's becoming the supply chain has been affected in, in many ways and so people are using things they're not familiar with a lot of despair a lot of things happening and so um, unfortunately we've had we've seen that however we haven't seen a reduction in people seeking treatment so one of the things I want to make sure uh, listeners understand is that opiate use disorders is adequately treated with suboxone and methadone and all of the programs in the state have remained open and have continually taken people in. So it's not because of lack of access to treatment, but more uh, use patterns uh, amongst our population. Wow. Well, um, so would you, you, would you say that the COVID pandemic has caused an increase in the number of people that you're seeing with these problems? I'm not so sure it's an increase. I think it is um, in many ways magnified the problem uh, for, for many people. I mean, let's face it, many people who end up using substances do it out of despair or emotional distress. And 
deaths of family members, l- lack of, um, uh, of good jobs, uh, difficulty in, in being isolated. I think it's a natural incubator for people to feel despondent and perhaps increase the amount of their use. We've had people who've been doing well for a while who've relapsed and, and begun to use more and begun to use dangerously. So it has definitely had an effect on, on the psyche of the population in general. And you see more and more of it in, in the substance use world. I, for a long time, I've thought that uh, the inequitable distribution of wealth in this country is an underlying cause of substance abuse. Do you agree with that? Well, I think that it does not discriminate. Uh, I have taken care of well-to-do people. I have taken care of people who grew up in, in poverty because, remember, the human brain, once it's exposed to opioids, sometimes gets changed in such a way that people cannot stop. So people like you or I who were given pain medication by a physician, perhaps, and we were prescribed for too long, we could theoretically also develop a problem with substances. And so um, certainly we know that people who have had uh, adverse childhood events um, are more at risk, but it does not discriminate um, in terms of who, who ends up being affected by it. By adverse child events, you mean sexual abuse? Well, sexual abuse, physical trauma, emotional neglect, uh, poverty, uh, mm-hmm. bullying, uh, you know, variety of things that happen to, uh, to children at a very young age that in many ways um, affect them as, as they age. And many times drugs make people feel better. Well, hmm. um, well, I think you mentioned Oxycontin and some other medications that are used as painkillers. Is that right? Yeah, OxyContin uh, in the in the 90s and uh, the 2000s, it was just rampant uh, in terms of its use around the country. And it's interesting, many of the people that I talk to, I always like to know how, how old they were when they started. And it is so common to hear that people as teenagers were either prescribed painkillers by pediatricians or orthopedists and they were continued for a period of time or they had access to friends and families pills recreationally uh, but clearly that fueled a significant uptick in the number of people with opioid use disorder, probably by four or five fold. Four or five fold. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. it, typically the, the, the data showed in the early 90s for decades, there were about a million daily heroin users. In fact, during the height of the HIV epidemic, that was a number that was banded, banded around was about a, a million daily heroin users. And after the uptick in prescription opioids and the, the wholesale pharmaceutical marketing of them, somewhere around five to six million people ended up you know, being opioid dependent because of painkillers. So the numbers uh, grew exponentially uh, after the, the introduction of, of those medications. I've, I've been told repeatedly that the manufacturers of Oxycontin really promoted its use. Is that true? Yes, I believe so. There was a, it was a wonderful article in the New Yorker a couple of years ago about the Sackler family, and it really exposed their techniques of, um, of education and manipulation, um, the, the, the different benefits that they gave the, to, the, to uh, doctors. In fact, a number of years ago, I think when Bill Sorrell was attorney general, I think a law was passed. I know a law was passed in Vermont, which limited any pharmaceutical company from if they gave a doctor more than $25 or $50 in something or other had to be um, declared as a public record. And I remember a couple of many years ago, it was a little embarrassing to find out some of your colleagues who were getting tens of thousands of dollars in dinners and trips and all these different perks from the opioid manufacturers. So it was a helpful strategy to perhaps publicly shame some of us into not taking um, the lucrative offers, which obviously affects the way that we prescribe. When you're given samples of medication or you're given some kind of a benefit, it just fuels the, the prescribing by docs, even though it may not be, be indicated. And then we just recently had that federal settlement which showed that people were being steered towards prescribing uh, Oxyco- Oxycontin that was um, uh, orchestrated by, the, by Purdue Pharma. 
I remember reading that article you mentioned and the Sacklers and, mm -hmm. and the staggering amounts of money that they made. I mean, they literally made billions, as I recall. Yeah. And there's yeah. some beautiful parts of um, the Metropolitan Museum and New York and wings of other museums around the world that they have, um, you know, philanthropically donated to. And uh, now it's, it's all called into question. Yeah, well, um, do you think that these prescription painkillers like Oxycontin should be made available without prescription, that people should be able to buy them if they want them? That's a really interesting question, and I'll tell you why. I was watching a movie the other day, and uh, someone was in Mexico, and they wanted a prescription, and the pharmacist said, oh, no, it's over the counter. You don't need a prescription for it. So I know that in Canada, even Tylenol with codeine, uh, you can purchase without a prescription. So certainly we in the United States don't take that position that these things should be made available. Um, but I think the experience in other countries, it would be interesting to see whether people are any more likely to become users when it's over the counter. I think you know my training and my upbringing is that you need to very closely regulate um, drugs that will put people at risk for having difficulties. But again, I, I have to say I'm, I'm biased uh, by my education and my, my training, and I'm not super familiar with what does happen in other countries where they are less restricted. Well, as a judge, I've certainly dealt with a lot of people who've had endless grief because of substance abuse. And, um, you know, I've, I've been involved in the treatment. I ordered people into treatment programs as a condition of release. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, remarkable how successful that treatment was. So it made me think there's some hope for this. It's not, it's not all futile. Well, you know, here's the interesting thing. If I prescribe narcotics pain medicine for you, you go to the drugstore and you say, my doctor gave me this. There's a legitimacy around it. And for many patients, the doctor kept prescribing long after the person needed it, and the person became physically dependent. So that dynamic drove a lot of people to becoming physically dependent. If you hurt yourself and you went to the pharmacy and you could buy a prescription painkiller without a prescription, maybe you'd buy three or four of them. Maybe you'd take a few and that would be it. You wouldn't necessarily have somebody in authority saying it's okay to take these. And so you wonder whether the dynamic of that has made things worse by being prescribed versus having it widely available and you take it if you need it and if you don't need it, you're never going near it. I mean, that's a, it's a plausible explanation, but I think what you're saying is that we have a nation of drug takers and, and people who like to, to medicate. And so, um, and you've encountered people who have uh, opiate use problems and I take care of thousands of them and Treatment is very, very effective. Treatment with methadone or Suboxone is very, very effective for, for taking care of people whose brains have been altered by being exposed to opioids for a little too long. Well, my impression is that as part of the treatment, if there's some kind of counseling or some kind of contact with a physician or someone who's trying to help the person, that that's a real plus. It's not just a question of being given pills. It's a question of being told that being encouraged to, to overcome the addiction. Do you, do, you, do you buy that? Do you think that's true? Well, I, I guess I'm going to challenge a little bit when you say overcome the addiction, because when it comes to opioids and probably alcohol, the brain is in many cases changed in some ways permanently. Wow. We can't cure it. We can help correct it. But I have taken care of people who my treatment has failed to help them. Uh, I've given them methadone. They continue to use opiates. I've given them Suboxone. They continue to use opiates. They've been put in jail. They come out. They continue to use opiates. And I look at it like I do cancer. There are some patients I've taken care of who've died of lung cancer despite being given chemotherapy. So it's not an absolute. We have to think about substance use disorder as being manageable but not curable um, in the case of opiates and alcohol. When it comes to cocaine, uh, methamphetamine, you know, there's no, there's, no farm, there's no medication that I can give somebody. So we know that 
there are certain therapies and treatments that work, but not everybody's going to take them. And I'm sure even in your case, you, you remand people to treatment, you send them to prison, they come out and they, they may continue to use despite all of those negative effects. So it's baffling sometimes as to why some people get it and some people don't. And I don't have an answer as to why it doesn't happen all the time. Well, in my experience, you know, I put large numbers of people into treatment as a condition of release. And I, I, there was a study done retros, retrospective to what happened. And the first 172 people I put into treatment, three years later, they were checked up on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and 80% of them had stopped using. And this was for what substances, though? Because I think that matters. It was for painkillers, mm -hmm. Oxycontin, okay. and... and uh, large amounts of THC of marijuana. Yeah, and yeah. and eighty percent stopped. Yeah, and then there was a there was a part of the study they took a group of three hundred defendants, same drugs, same high dosage of experience, and in that group there was no treatment, mm -hmm. but they had an eighty four percent recidivism rate mm -hmm. in the three years following their first contact with the courts. So I, I think there's something, I don't think it's futile. <laughs> I just think it's something that should be, should be paid for. That society should come up with the money and say, hey, here it is. I'm just hoping that, um, I'm just hoping to, to find answers to help people, you know? Well, I think when it comes to cannabis, I think your experience is such that, you know, we do know that people are able to, to stop using cannabis at a much greater rate than they're able to stop using opiates on their own because people don't tend to get sick. And we also know that, you know, heroin really is different than painkillers in terms of how it changes the brain. So there, there's got to be subtleties and nuances, but it sounds like those results were point towards the fact that treatment does work. I think that's the bottom line. And getting help through counseling and therapy in addition to medication certainly can increase your likelihood of remaining abstinent and doing well. And so I think your results bear that out. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, it, it, it makes me think we just got to try harder, <laughs> you know, got to mm -hmm. try harder. It's uh, because I think the social cost of these, these problems is just staggering. The number of people who, who don't make, who can't who lose their jobs, who lose their families, harm other people. Is this, I, I think I've been seeing that there's more fentanyl being distributed in, in co connection with heroin. Is that true? Yeah, it's almost, uh, it's almost, it's almost impossible to find fentanyl free heroin. Almost every powder that someone is using, whether it's, suppose, I don't even call it heroin anymore. I say, some opioid, some white powder that has opioid in it, it's almost exclusively fentanyl. There's very little heroin. We're finding it a lot in cocaine now, fentanyl. We're finding it sometimes in methamphetamine. Uh, we're finding it pressed into uh, look-alike um, uh, sedatives. It, it looks like you're taking a sedative, but it's really fentanyl that's been pressed to look like, um, like a, a, a benzodiazepine. And so it's very, very dangerous. People are, are very scared. They don't know what's in their drug supply anymore. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's a real tragedy to see how, how many people are using and dying because they just have a, a great difficulty in being able to determine how much is in it. Well, where does this fentanyl come from? You know, it, it has been, it's been coming predominantly from China, but I was listening, um, to a report the other day that said that um, the U.S. and China have somehow brokered a deal where China has been restricted on sending fentanyl to the United States. I mean, clearly you can still get it, but what's happening now is apparently it's being routed through Mexico. So fentanyl is now coming from China to Mexico and then making its way into the United States or, or coming through Canada into the U.S. Previously, it was you could import it into the um, into the US right from China. In fact, it was interesting. They said you could even go onto the internet in broad daylight and order fentanyl and have it shipped to the US. That's how brazen some of these um, distributors were. And now I think a lot of those sites, or at least I've read, have been restricted or cut down. Um, and, and that's predominantly where my understanding is where it's coming from. And is it, is it, is it, is it something that, Instantly addictive? Is it something that causes 
uh, an aggravation of someone's condition? Well, it's it's highly um, it's highly uh, addictive. It's it's like it's a very powerful opiate. They use it in anesthesia all the time. I mean, if you go in for a simple procedure in the hospital, you need to be put asleep. You'll get some fentanyl to relieve the pain. Um, it's very fast acting. It is certainly a, a drug of desire because it works very quickly and gives an intense euphoria. So people really, really like it. Uh -huh. um, but the problem is that under conditions that it's not monitored, if you get a, a powder, you're just the, at the whim of some backdoor, you know, backyard chemist making it up as he goes along, as opposed to a U.S. pharmaceutical company that's giving you a certain amount of fentanyl in, in the IV that you're getting. So I think that's really the danger. A very small amount of fentanyl is enough to get an entire city, um, you know, uh, supply for a period of time you don't need much you can walk in with a small fanny pack full of fentanyl and the entire city could could be um could be using that amount as opposed to kilos of heroin which you need so oh, it's, it's that much more powerful that much more powerful absolutely you take a pen the, the tip of a pen you don't need much more than that to get an effect from it a single dose <clears throat> wow wow so, you know, when, when we restrict pills, people then turn to heroin and, you know, you don't get heroin, you, you're down to fentanyl. It's, it's really astounding. Well, what, what do you understand by, you know, there's these public articles that are written about talking about decriminalization, legalization. What, do you think there's some best way to try to manage this, this, this distribution of these addictive chemicals? Well, I think I've come to realize over the decades that our brains are wired, you know, we're sort of, our, our brains are, are wired for novelty. Humanity has advanced through, through new ideas and finding new things, but for many people, they're just waiting for the next new thing. So the difficulty is, I don't think it should be a crime. I don't think you should sit behind bars for doing a drug for experimenting. I think what happens is that people become so frustrated with citizens' use, depending on what it is, they get behind the wheel, they drive drunk. You know, you're so aggravated, we, we put them behind bars because we're angry at them, and maybe that's a reasonable approach. But I think that criminalizing it has not solved the problem. However, making treatment much more widely available and without stigma, to me, helps answer the question about, well, what do you do for people that are using substances? And I think it was, I'm not, I think it was Jim Douglas that talked about, or Peter Shumlin talked about the three-legged stool in Vermont. You want education, you want treatment, and you want prevention. And so, you know, part, but, 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 uh, putting people behind bars or charging them with criminal offenses wasn't part of that three-legged stool. So from my perspective, people are going to do what they want. They're going to try different things. And if they get in trouble, they should get help, but not necessarily uh, make it legal, but also not necessarily make it criminalization. So I think a decriminalization policy is not a bad way to go, at least from where I sit as a physician. I haven't sat in a courtroom and as a judge, but that would be my perspective is to put a lot more effort into prevention and education and then treatment. Well, what I have found is, well, the experience in Vermont is that 80% of the people who are charged with DV1 are never charged again. They yep. stop. Okay. They, they learn. Mm -hmm. You know, they've been arrested, they've been brought in, they, you know, they've had to look at someone like me, so sorry, and, and they, they stop. No, they stop. And it's the 20% that get arrested again that go on. Mm -hmm. And you have these people who, I mean, I know of a case recently, the guy's charged with DUI 5. And, yep. and they, you know, they're killing people. Yeah. More than 10,000 people a year die in the United States because of alcohol-related crashes every year. Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, it's really hard. Yeah, it is. And, and I think what happens is that we haven't done a good job of identifying those people. Um, and, you know, there's actually some, some pretty good evidence-based treatments for alcohol use disorder. But if there's no follow-up and no ramification for it, people tend to stop. 
And we also know that there are some people for whom alcohol is just a toxin for them, and they're going to spend the rest of their life fighting that demon. And yeah. so the issue becomes, if you have someone and I mean, I have patients, they were given the Alka sensor in their car, and they have somebody else blow into it to get the car started. You know, there's all kinds of ways around uh, these things, and it's it's a shame. But I think for some people, no matter how many consequences they have, they won't be able to stop. And as you say, for most people, one consequence is enough. But, you know, one deadly crash is one too many. Yeah. Uh, it's just, you know, we have fairly liberal alcohol laws. Some some countries, the, the BAC is 0.04. Yeah. Here in the U.S., it's 0.08. It came down from 0.1. Yeah. So, you know, we're pretty generous still, unfortunately, with our alcohol use and our driving. Mm. Well, when you deal when you deal with someone like this, is, is the treatment usually, I mean, is there medication and counseling? Or what, what do you think is most effective? Well, we know that for people who have alcoholism, the alcohol use disorder, that, you know, the use of antabuse clearly will stop people from drinking. If they if they take antabuse every day, and they drink, they'll get sick. There's another medicine, naltrexone, that's an injection once a month. It reduces the amount that people drink, reduces the cravings. There's a couple other medications. They have to take them every day. They can do counseling. But I think if you're really going to be serious about it, you have to have you know, some pretty solid teeth in this if you're really going to help people not drink. Maybe they need to you know, again, wear some kind of, a, of an Alka sensor on a regular basis. And if something gets detected, there's a, there's a result. There's also all these fascinating studies that continue to be done to try to untangle why people can't stop drinking, what happens in the brain. It's still, I got to be honest, a bit of an unknown as to why some people just can't stop. And we still don't have enough tools in our tool bag to help every person who's got alcohol use disorder unfortunately but some people do stop at most people do stop i mean even under the advice of the physician a lot of times you know you say to somebody i think you've got a problem with alcohol and it's affecting this this and this that just that simple little bit of advice with some work people will significantly reduce the amount of alcohol that they drink absolutely well i've always thought that probation was often successful I would put someone on probation in one of these cases, and I would never see him again. Right. You know, now some of them, I the probation officer would come in and say he's done this, she's done that, and uh, you don't have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. But I always thought that the the threat of incarceration often will deter people from abusing substances. Do you think that's true? I, I think you know, knowing humans like I think I know humans, I think the fear of <laughs> punishment works. It does work <laughs> in many ways. I mean, it's what drives most of us to do the right thing. Yeah, it's what the common law calls specific deterrence. <laughs> yeah. Specific, I like very fancy language. There's also general deterrence. Yeah. Right. You said an example that other people will look to and think, well, I better not do that. You know, that exactly. kind of thing. But it's, it's just hard. It's just hard. Do you think there should be ed education about this in, in schools? Do you think children should be talk talk talked to about this? The twelve and thirteen year olds should be given counseling. You mean be taught about substances? Yep. I think it would be good to have uh, people have a better understanding of how their brain works and how drugs work in the brain. I'm not talking about Project Dare. I'm not talking about scaring people. I'm just saying giving some information. And the other thing that I, I've been always interested in is you know doing a decent amount of screening in very young children to understand, are they at risk? Do they have ACEs, adverse childhood events, that's gonna put them at risk as they get older for substance use disorder? And how much attention do we do we pay to that? You know, we talk about, takes a village. Um, you have counselors in schools, you have teachers in schools, they see kids that are having difficulties and problems. The resources aren't always there, especially in, 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 in states like Vermont, which is, you know, not necessarily resource rich. and we do have people that sort of fall by the wayside and end up turning to substances. And you wonder if you had intervened early and perhaps had some alternatives, whether or not you could have prevented them from, from moving on to substance use. I take care of a lot of people that are fathers and mothers of young children and the fathers and mothers I'm treating for drug and alcohol use. And I talk to them about, you know, what do you think the risk for your child is? What, what do you do 
to, you know, do you, do you worry that your child's going to turn to opioids or turn to alcohol? What kinds mm -hmm. of strategies have you employed? And it's always interesting to hear the different points of view about how they struggle with what to do and, and how to, if, if possible, prevent their kids from ending up like they did. Do they try to counsel the children? Do they, what, what, what practically, uh, what, what advice do you give them? Well, I think what, what I've said is, you know, first of all, <clears throat> have you ever, has the conversation about drugs and alcohol come up in your family? And I'm not a fan of necessarily telling war stories to your, to your kids like, oh yeah, when I was your age, I was getting, I was doing this and that, because I think sometimes kids think, well, dad or mom did it, it's okay if I did it. I think really exploring with the kids, you know, what they know about substances, whether they're friends uh, are using, what's it, how do they feel, you know, when they're around this person? Do they think that they might want to try it? And do they know much about it? And really trying to help the, the parents educate the kids versus pretend they're in an AA meeting and they have to share all the dirty details that they had, because I'm not so sure that's helpful. And then if it looks like the, the person, the, the child, the teenager is starting to to drift off, think, well, what other, what pro-social activities can we do together? How can I perhaps spend more time or do more things? Uh, how can I step in as a parent and say, no, you can't go to this house unsupervised or you can't go with this person here and, you know, act like a parent and try to protect your children from what inevitably is waiting around the corner for them. If, if the parents are using substances, you think it makes it more likely that their children will do that? I do. I do. And I think it's a risky situation because they're not paying as much attention as they could. And obviously, if a child sees a parent doing something, it immediately legitimizes it. I mean, they say, well, you know, in fact, I say to them, even if right now, you know, you don't think that your child knows you're, you're, you're smoking, you know, cannabis to go to bed at night, they can kind of tell there's a smell in the air. They might they might find your pipe and you know it's only a matter of time what are you going to say when they confront you about that what are you going to say and so those kinds of conversations we have a lot and it gives people things to think about as they continue to use and in many cases uh people will make a decision to stop using or continue using but then you know have a conversation with the with the children at some point if it does arise it won't always go well you know they, they get confronted and said well you know, especially when it comes to tobacco, I mean, you think about smokers, you know, the worst of all habits, the most dangerous of all, the most deadly of all. And I have parents who are still smoking in front of their kids. And I'm just baffled as to how they do that. Although they do try to, you know, not smoke around their kids, smoke outside, but they get grief all the time from their kids. Like mom, dad, why can't you stop? And, you know, that sometimes is enough of an incentive for them to think about at least reducing what they're smoking or, or at least makes them think about it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, what are there any additional resources that you'd like to have in dealing with these people? Well, I think, um, you know, Vermont being a very rural state makes it difficult for patients to sometimes get to treatment. Um, you know, fortunately, our state has put funding into transportation, getting people to clinics and doctor's offices and all that. Um, I, I think that from my perspective, we've done a very good job. I mean, we're the envy of the nation when it comes to treating opiate use disorder. We've got more people per capita in treatment than anywhere else in the United States. Oh, I didn't um, know that. Yeah, we have, um, we have the hub and spoke model, which is trying to be replicated around the United States. Um, alcohol use is actually you know, kind of on the rise with COVID. I think that... Um, you know, the isolation is really doing a number on people. And I'm concerned that when we come out on the other end, there are an awful lot of people who are going to struggle with, um, with the amount of alcohol that they've been consuming. Uh, and I think the other thing that's going to be really important is to make sure that we keep training our physicians, our nurses, our social workers to be good when it comes to screening for substance use, because people will hide it. They won't want to talk about it. There are people who return to use who are embarrassed. And so having people um, feel comfortable talking about their drug use and alcohol use, I think is really important. Otherwise it's, it's a hidden, you don't know about it. Well, well, just, just 
I think I, I certainly agree with the, the gist of what you're saying. My question is, where do we find, is there an agency to be set up? Should there be a, like a counseling branch uh, of the courts or uh, how would this work? Well, I guess if you think about it from a court perspective, we have, I think we have three drug courts now in the state. Mm -hmm. I think every, I think every county should have a drug court. And I think the federal courts, I think there's one that's, I think Judge Sessions has a, or Judge Crawford, I think one of them may have a, a drug court of sorts. But I, I do believe that all counties and all uh, our federal uh, jurisdictions should have drug courts that support uh, people being on medication, uh, assisted treatment if they need it. Um, because I do believe that diversion is much more valuable. I know our attorney general believes that, um, you know, diversion is much more important than, than criminality. But I don't know the mechanics of the court system to know why we don't have more you know, why we don't have a drug court in each county, um, the resources around that, I'm just not familiar with it. Well, it's not, not, it's not mysterious, you know. <laughs> they, there's just there's just not enough money, mm -hmm. I think. It's just, uh, you know, the old expression, money talks. Um, it's hard, very difficult. I mean, I, I do, I will say, I have lots of people who I take care of who end up back in, in behind bars. and. In Vermont now, if you're on methadone or buprenorphine, up until two years ago, you often had to come off of it, and you went in and you were detoxed in jail. And now, treatment's continued, and that's been a, an amazing change. But I'm always baffled, and, and perhaps you can answer, when I have somebody that looks like they're doing pretty well in treatment, their urines are negative, um, but they've obviously got you know criminal charges, they've been in and out of jail, and then they suddenly go back to jail, they get violated, and I guess I would ask, well, what's the cost of that incarceration? You know, what's the value of putting someone behind bars? What's the cost to us? And if we had more money that wasn't for incarceration, but more for keeping people out and perhaps figuring out a way to get them to do what they're supposed to do, would that be a way to save money for more treatment versus incarceration? Again, I'm not sitting in the probation officer. I didn't, I don't know if probation officer says, hey, you can't go down to that person's house or, you know, you've got to be in by six o'clock at night or you can't lose your housing, all these different things that sometimes can be very challenging for people. And if they don't achieve them, they end up going back to jail. Well, is there an alternative to that in terms of a, of a shifting of cost? I, I would ask that question. Well, and also, I think it's very hard to generalize about this. Yeah. Each case is unique to its facts. Each yeah. person has a different history. Yeah. You know, sometimes people have been through probation and counseling over and over again, mm -hmm. and then they do something really dreadful. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're punished. Yeah. Um, not yeah. because, I think, speaking for myself, not because it's fun to punish people, mm -hmm. because you think you just have to do it. Yeah. You know, you just have to. And, and frankly, some of the most rewarding things I've, I've experienced as a judge is when people come back to me and tell me, you know, you put my kid in jail, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I remember I, one, one case. It was just extraordinary, where you know the kid was fixing my garage door, and to make a long story short, he he thanked me for putting him in jail. Oh, oh my God! The first time you met me, you put me on probation. And the second time, I did something really awful, and you put me in jail for nine months. Right. And he looked me right in the eye. He said, "Judge, that was eight years ago." And since I got out, I'm not using drugs. I'm married. I've got a four-year-old son. Mm -hmm. And then he looked me right in the eye and said, thank you. Uh -huh. So it's, it's not all futile. You yeah, know? right. It's not all futile. And right. I think it, we just got to, we just can't be uh, vindictive about this. I think that's really important. But I guess what I was trying to answer was, is there, you know, the resources, is there, are there some cases that perhaps are not as to the extent that you're mentioning, but a relatively low level reinfraction, someone goes back to jail. Uh, uh, what are the nuances of that? Yeah. I never really know. And, um, and you're right, some of them are complex, but you wonder whether or not there are some opportunities still that exist in the system, perhaps to divert some of those people from going back. And well, I think, I think the answer is, it, my comment would be, you try to exhaust all the non-jail alternatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then if you, if you decide you've got to use jail, you do what I call the short hit. Mm -hmm. you, know, you put somebody in for 30 days. 
-hmm. You don't say, oh, probation failed, it's two to five years to serve. Mm -hmm. that, that doesn't necessarily, uh, that, that doesn't sound good to me. Right. Well, look, we've, we've run, uh, we've got done almost an hour, my friend. Oh, my. You're terrific. I want to thank you for what you're doing. Well, thank you. Thank Sincerely, you. Sincerely, it's, it's terrific what you're doing. And I think it's, uh, it's a great thing you've done. And I hope you can keep it up. God willing, me too. And thanks for having me. It's been enjoyable. Okay. And I want you to understand, if, you, if you've got something that comes up that you want to tell the world about, call me and you'll be on the Judge Ben Show. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you're, you're someone I would like to speak to more than once. Sure, and I want to thank the people who have looked in today. I hope this works out. This is a, uh, this remote screening is very different. <laughs> I wish we were in a studio face to face, but we've got to do the best we can uh, under these difficult situations. Yeah. I'm noticing the light guy didn't come to my house because all of a sudden it's dark in this room and I look like I'm just, uh, I look you're, like you're doing fine. You're doing fine. I didn't think about the lighting. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I probably have too much light, but whatever. <laughs> Thanks again, John. Take care. Be well. Talk you to you too. Soon. Stay safe.